We are now live. One, uh, as Trish mentioned, we had planned on doing this, uh, it was at least a couple of weeks ago as an in-person talk. Of course, those plans got crashed. In the meantime, um, my hair is growing. I actually toyed with the idea of making this my uh, screen uh, persona because I am a <laughs> dog these days. <laughs> Got my scissors here too. Maybe you can stick around later. Um, we can take care of this, but that's a whole other topic. Um, I also wanted to say this is a new format for me. This is the first time I've presented uh, an online webinar, and I realized we, we practiced last week, so I think I've got the technical part down, but I realized, Trish and Jamie, I realized there's nobody here to give me a hook when time is up. So uh, if I get wound up and, and get going, I'm not going to know if you people are fidgeting. I won't know if you leave. So uh, it is being recorded, so you can come back later. It is such a gorgeous day. I want to try and contain um, my remarks so that we'll get you out on time. But there's just so much to talk about. Um, why don't you buckle yourselves in, and we're going to go for a ride through the Fox River Valley. We're going to take a look at the wildlife here. Get this loaded up. There we go. Coyotes to bees. Um, you know, I don't know uh, each one of you, your familiarity with the, uh, the Fox River Valley, your relationship with the Fox River. Uh, perhaps it's something like this. It's a nice place to walk along. Uh, you might be one of those cars that we see over here sitting on the bridge. Maybe you curse the river sometimes because you need a bridge to cross it. Um, I can assure you, uh, whether you're, you're deeply attached to the river or you just have a cursory knowledge of it, what we're going to see over the next hour is a, a wonderful uh, introduction and overview to the vast amount of wildlife that calls this region its home. Um, I took this picture a couple of months ago. This is down in uh, Geneva. Um, Island Park is in the background. This would be just south of the Geneva Bridge. Uh, you might look at that and go, well, Pam, this is great, but I don't see any wildlife. Um, let's zoom in just a little bit, and you might start to see some indication over here. Uh, I'm a naturalist, not a photographer. Um, Canada geese. Uh, again, if your uh, knowledge or association with the Fox River is maybe uh, a bit in its, in its early stages, you might think of the river as the place where those geese live. Uh, it certainly is home to thousands of Canada geese. Um, we could do a whole program about uh, the, uh, the presence of Canada geese in the Fox River, but I would say if we look at everything that's present in our Fox River Valley, this is probably the animal that people um, most associate uh, with the water and um, probably have the strongest feelings, either good or bad. <laughs> um, I'll share a couple of uh, nest cam uh, photos with you, not nest cam, uh, trail cam photos. This is just a couple of blocks away from the Fox River happening right now. This is a pair of Canada geese over at Del Norwoods Park in St. Charles. Uh, they're doing what geese do. They have uh, raised, um, their, their goslings have now hatched. I would imagine since it's so nice out today that they are out uh, paddling around the pond there at Del Norwoods. Uh, you might be looking at this going, oh my gosh, now there's more. Uh, yes, we do have a lot of geese, but as is so often the case with wildlife, what's perceived as a problem by us is often, uh, in this case, it was caused by us as well. Uh, throughout North America, there's, I believe, 11 subspecies of Canada geese. Back um, in the uh, early to mid part of the 19, uh, 1900s, the uh, 20th century, uh, it was noticed that uh, there was a subspecies that was missing. That was Maxima, the giant Canada goose. Uh, through a concerted uh, conservation effort, uh, that subspecies, there were some uh, captive individuals that were tracked down um, on a farm. Uh, that uh, captive stock was used to bring back the Maxima subspecies. And boy, it is back. Let me tell you, these birds are here. They have everything they could possibly want. Um, um, migration is not really a part of their makeup, so we have a lot of geese that uh, spend their uh, entire lives in the Fox River Valley. Now, um, uh, they, they may travel, you know, short distances here and there, but this is what we would call resident goose population. I, I took this picture a couple of months ago. 
Um, I can't tell you for sure if these are all resident geese because in the winter time we get visited. We are visited by um, uh, the uh, Hudson River or uh, Hudson Bay population of geese that comes down here and spends uh, the winter months. So there's um, even more geese that come around uh, in the winter time. Uh, that um, coming together of those two different subspecies is being closely uh, studied and monitored uh, in the hopes that some management practices can be put in place. Um, like I said, we could do a whole program on Canada geese. That's not why you're here. We've got lots of other things we're going to talk about. So let's move on to the other uh, very, very visible creature that you see when you're down by the water. Uh, that is the mallard duck. Um, this is another species that has been strongly influenced by humans. I would say a lot of the mallards we have here in the Fox River Valley are, um, they could be wild, they could have some domestic blood in them. Um, a lot of the mallards that we see along the Fox River are larger than what you'd see in a truly uh, wild um, breed of uh, the ducks. Uh, they are going about their business as well. We have um, uh, a fair, uh, fairly large population of breeding mallards in the Fox River Valley. Um, but we also have these guys. I mentioned uh, that uh, the uh, presence of humans does influence our wild populations. When you see ducks like this, and I'll get emails, uh, pictures like this, um, I would say, you know, maybe a couple of times a year when people are exploring the river and they go, oh my gosh, I thought I knew my ducks. What is this one? Well, this is an example of a hybrid. We've got uh, some mallard influence here. You can see in the, the head and the, the markings on the side, but then we've also got some domestic influence here along the breast. So, um, especially uh, in our uh, more suburban spots along the Fox River, the in-town locations, um, I'm very likely to see these hybrid ducks as well. Um, and then yeah, you never know what's gonna show up. Um, I, I put this picture in intentionally because it is a non-native swan that uh, people just go gaga over. It is a mute swan. Mute swans are often used to uh, help control uh, the Canada goose population. They're uh, a breeding pair of mute swans can be quite aggressive. Uh, they like to defend a large amount of territory. Um, but they, that's a little uneasy about our mute swan population here, uh, not just in the Fox River Valley, but actually throughout Illinois, they seem to be showing up with more and more regularity. And um, they do, like I said, they have that, that aggressive streak to them um, that can, can uh, lead to them spreading their range aggressively. Um, now we do have a couple of uh, native swans that can be spotted uh, along the Fox River, typically in the winter months, the tundra swan and then less frequently the trumpeter swan. If you look at the markings here on our mute swan, you'll see the, the uh, prominent orange bill and the serif here is uh, dark. Um, with our native swans, this is all going to be dark and then there's um, a couple different variations on yellow markings here for the tundra and the trumpeter swans. Um, now, last fall, I was, uh, I was walking along the river and I saw these are probably young of the year mallards. Um, and I, I, those of you who read my column, you know, I, I like to play this game called one of these things is not like the others. And I'm looking at these ducks and okay, mallard, 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 mallard. And, eh, hold on a second. What do we have here? Let's zoom in. Um, this duck is not a mallard. Look at the white eye ring. Look at the shape of the tail. Look at the shape of the bill. Um, this is a wood duck. I, I think it is also uh, young of the year. Um, it, this is an assumption I'm making. I, I sometimes assume things I shouldn't, but um, in this case, I, I feel kind of good about it. I was kayaking in uh, August as part of a program we were doing uh, about um, Paddle and Learn was what it was called, about the Fox River. And uh, we came across uh, four what appeared to be orphan wood ducks. And I almost wonder of those four, if uh, well, either three made it and went one direction and one buddied up with the mallards or three did not make it and this one found safety in numbers. But either way, it is always uh, worth your time if you see a group of birds and you know, this time of year, um, we do have flocks of birds that are migrating through, but our, a lot of our resident birds are not in groups right now because they are breeding and they don't like to be that close to each other. Um, 
during the breeding season. But uh, when you when you uh, when flocking season comes back again in the fall and winter, go carefully through what you're seeing to see if you notice any individuals that um, are not like the others. Now, wood ducks, these are crazy colorful birds. Uh, here's a pair, but let's, um, no disrespect to, to uh, Mrs. Wood Duck there, but when you look at a male wood duck, it's unlike anything we have around here in terms of coloration. I mean, we've got whites, we've got blues, we've got greens, we've got browns, we've got speckles, we've got plain. Uh, we've got stripes. It is, uh, he's got it all going on. Not only is this a spectacular looking species, um, but they nest in trees. Uh, they, uh, they're cavity nesters. Um, the importance of leaving um, dead or, or not so healthy trees that have large holes in them is, I can't emphasize that enough. There's so many species that rely on uh, cavities for nesting. Uh, wood ducks need um, fairly large, well, it, it's smaller than you'd think, but um, uh, the, I'm gonna hold my hands up here. The, the hole for a wood duck cavity needs to be about the size of a, about 12 inch softball. Um, if you're out uh, and about, you may notice that some people are uh, trying to help the wood duck by putting up wood duck boxes. Here's an example of one. You can see the hole here. Um, check these out. If you happen to see one, observe it from a distance and see if you see any activity, especially around uh, dawn and dusk. Uh, like they are built for wood ducks. Some of them are actually in water uh, to uh, help the wood ducks because uh, when the uh, uh, ducklings uh, are ready to leave. Uh, they're not fledged. I mean, they are just uh, recently out of the shell. Their down is, um, they're down covered. Um, they need to get to water as quickly as possible. So some of these boxes are actually on poles in water. Some of them though are attached to trees uh, and they become homes for other creatures too. Uh, tree squirrels, flying squirrels, uh, screech owls will sometimes be found peering out of wood duck, box, duck boxes. So um, again, you're, you're looking maybe for one species, but uh, you never know, you might see some other ones too. Now, um, I, we could spend a whole afternoon talking about birds of uh, the Fox River Valley. I want to try to keep my remarks uh, short so we can get onto some of the other groups of animals, but I can't move along without mentioning these two magnificent species, the osprey and the bald eagle. I think of the two, the bald eagle is probably a little bit uh, better recognized, more widely known. My goodness, it's our nation's symbol. Um, and it has come back from being federally endangered and on the brink of extinction. Um, back in the 1960s, uh, about the time of Silent Spring, in fact, Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring, she uh, counted the number of bald eagles that she saw on a, a tour of the, uh, the Mississippi River, and it was in the double digit. It was, you know, I, I want to say it was, it was less than a hundred speed from from one end of the Mississippi to the other, um, less than a hundred individuals, which is pretty scary considering that there were at one time uh, hundreds of thousands of these birds <clears throat> across the country. Uh, the main culprit uh, that's being blamed is DDT. DDT was a popular uh, insecticide used to control mosquitoes. It had an unwanted effect of concentrating in the food chain uh, as it traveled up. Um, and, uh, eagles uh, eat a, a lot of fish. They are actually kind of scavengers. They don't eat exclusively. Uh, that's not their exclusive diet, um, but they do eat a fair amount of fish in the uh, the poison in the DDT concentrated up the food chain. Didn't kill the birds outright, but it made it hard for them to reproduce. Uh, their eggshells became very thin. When the female would go to set on the eggs, uh, they would be crushed and uh, no reproduction would occur. So um, again, bald eagles have staged remarkable comeback. The uh, uh, kind of a one-two punch of, of eliminating DDT in this country and also um, the Clean Water Act improved our waterways by leaps and bounds. For an animal that consumes fish, if you've got um, clean water, uh, you're gonna have a diverse fish population and that's going to bode well for your future. Now, the, the osprey um, is actually still considered endangered here in Illinois, but uh, federally it is not. There are robust populations in different parts of the country. Um, I feel really fortunate to be here in the Fox River Valley seeing these birds. Um, 
with some regularity, they do migrate so we don't see them in the winter months well, the way we do the eagles. In fact, our eagle population is kind of supplemented in the winter by those birds that come down uh, from uh, northern regions where water might be frozen over. Uh, the osprey, so they fly south, they are coming back about now. In fact, uh, we're hearing some reports, I believe, um, I don't know if any of our resident, uh, summer resident ospreys have returned, but uh, I know a couple people have seen them hunting in um, uh, re retention ponds, actually. Um, I wanted to have you get a good look at these two birds. The um, bald eagle, you can see the, the plane of the wings here is pretty straight. And uh, the bald eagle is a little bit heftier bird. You're going to have a wingspan of more than six feet. Not that you can be up in the sky measuring them, but they, they are a large, dark bird. Mature bald eagles will have the white uh, head and the white tail. Uh, immature, though, a, a first-year eagle is going to be mostly dark. Uh, sometimes they're mistaken for turkey vultures. But just to contrast that with what we've got over here with the osprey, we've got uh, what I think of as the, the, the bandit mask here, the, the, the stripe that uh, leads back from the eye. And then uh, even if you can't see details, if you can see that it's a, a somewhat dark bird, but it's got this crook in the wings, it, it almost looks like a gull sometimes when you, if, you, um, if it's really, really up high. But um, contrast that, that crook at the, the wrist here of the osprey with the uh, straight out wings of the bald eagle. Uh, that's going to help a lot with your ID. Um, so ospreys are nesting. I believe there's at least three active nests over Fermilab. Um, recently, the Forest Preserve District of King County uh, put up a um, nesting platform over Oakhurst. Uh, I know there's also an osprey nest platform down um, in Montgomery. I thought it was interesting though, um, Fermilab, I did a little Googling and I learned that Fermilab, so let, uh, this photo here, let me back up a second. This photo shows uh, where the South Batavia Dam uh, once uh, stood. This dam came out in 2007, just for a little orientation. This is Funway, so those of you familiar with the area might know uh, Funway uh, there on uh, Route 25, about two miles south of Wilson Street in Batavia. Um, well, Fermilab is a little over two miles over here to the east, and about two miles here to the uh, southwest is uh, Mooseheart, which is where our local um, Central Kane County bald eagles are breeding. I thought it was really interesting that um, both these uh, fish-eating birds have chosen to uh, set up uh, housekeeping within two miles of this wonderfully uh, restored area. And the dam came out, it was kind of failing uh, on its own, um, <clears throat> but, but uh, breaking it up some more and um, uh, allowing the river to flow freely has really uh, uh, added a lot of, um, well, there's a lot of oxygen being incorporated into the water as it, as it spills over where the dam once was. Uh, being able to open things up allows fish and other animals to migrate uh, using the water this way. You go uh, down here is Glenwood Park, Park Forest Preserve. You go there pretty much any time of the year. If the water's open, um, there's going to be people fishing there because this is a fabulous um, spot for uh, smallmouth bass. Uh, you might see people, as I said, you might also see um, the eagles and the osprey. Um, we are um, part, here on, in the Fox River Valley, we are part of what is called the Mississippi Flyway, which are these green bands here. I, I mention this only because we are in the midst of the spring migration. We've got all kinds of warblers showing up right now. Uh, <clears throat> some of these routes extend down through Central America into South America. And if there's ever a time to get out and see things, it's now. The leaves aren't out on the trees. Um, the warblers that are coming through and other birds too, actually, they're, they're in their breeding plumage, so they're at their brightest, uh, their most colorful uh, phases, especially the males. So um, we're so lucky to be a part of this uh, region here. We're, we're connected by this waterway to the Illinois River, which takes us to the Mississippi, and this Mississippi flyway is just so well traversed by so many gorgeous species. Please, 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 if you can, get out. Even if you don't know what the birds are, they are just um, so fun to see as they're migrating through. 
Um, now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to stay uh, in the realm of uh, warm-blooded creatures for a little while here. Um, if um, say birds aren't your thing, uh, but you have noticed some activity along the Fox River uh, in a mammal form, chances are it's a muskrat, especially if you see something in the daytime. Um, the muskrat population um, throughout the Fox River Valley is, um, dare I say, booming. Um, <clears throat> The uh, picture here that shows these little huts, this is off of Wenmouth Road, which is uh, in Batavia, uh, south of Fabian uh, Parkway. And uh, we, we've, uh, again, humans haven't set out to improve the muskrat population, but some of the other things we've done have made it very easy for them to survive. Uh, we've created a lot of wetlands in the form of retention ponds. Uh, we've also got our Fox River and its tributaries. Um, uh, muskrats are primarily herbivores, not entirely. They, they actually have a, a taste and, dare I say, a weakness for freshwater mussels. Uh, they eat a lot of mussels when they can find them, but um, they are uh, present in just about any waterway that's associated with the Fox River. Um, this uh, can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. Um, not going to dwell on destruction of muskrats, but um, they turn up dead on roads quite a bit at this time. Well, actually, we're just past uh, what I call muskrat massacre season. Um, the uh, ecology, biology of the species is that the, the young stay with their parents for a year, but then they're kind of kicked out of uh, their dens uh, as the parents prepare for the, the coming young for this year. So uh, usually um, once the water starts to thaw, so we're talking you know, maybe late February, March, those young muskrats are heading out and uh, unfortunately they don't have the skills um, necessary to cross busy roads. A lot of times uh, they don't make it across. Um, I, I, I kind of, being a naturalist and you know, a nerd, um, I kind of mentally track where I see uh, a lot of muskrats getting run over uh, Peck Road and uh, Route 38. There's um, usually a fair number there. Um, if you go down Orchard Road, um, down towards Aurora, uh, there is um, a couple of stretches there that where there's um, wet areas, uh, roadside ditches and, and wetlands where there's a, a lot of muskrats. What I found interesting this year was that um, the, the massacre, as I thought of it, was reduced um, because the, the muskrats leaving home also coincided with us staying in our homes. So not as many cars. Is it you know, valid scientific data. No, I wasn't out there. You know, I don't have the numbers to, to back up what I was seeing. I just know that I didn't see as many dead muskrats this year because um, I did happen to travel past some of those uh, places over the last few weeks. Um, one place I did see a dead muskrat, right over here, downtown St. Charles on Main Street, right in front of the Baker Hotel. So they, they do turn up in um, interesting places. Um, very, very, very common mammal in the Fox River. Um, this next animal, I'm not going to show the picture yet, but you can probably guess what it is. If you're seeing fallen trees, you're seeing signs of our, uh, actually our, our state's largest rodent, the beaver. Um, beaver populations are also doing quite well in our area. I did want to um, point out though that, that sometimes people don't realize we have beavers because they think well beavers build dams and live in lodges. Uh, in a body of water like the Fox River, building a dam isn't uh, possible. You, some, there, there might be some backwater areas um, where uh, there's, there's smaller channels off to the side. Those might um, be uh, able to be dammed up, but by and large um, there's not a beaver around that's going to attempt to, to span the river with a dam. So what we have here is, um, put a little uh, drawing in here of uh, what a bank den would look like. Uh, we have beaver up and down the Fox River that um, will dig up into uh, the river bank. Uh, they want to make sure their entrance is below uh, water level so uh, predators aren't as apt to get in. And then they, uh, they kind of hang out in here. A great clue for this, um, if you're trying to find bank dens, like I said, it's going to be hard to find the entrance unless we're in a drought. But in the fall, uh, beavers will uh, stockpile food in what's called a food cache. It might be uh, sticks. Um, a couple of times I've seen corn stalks. 
But uh, if you see an, a large amount of debris in an area that doesn't really seem to have a, a natural snag, uh, chances are you're looking at the, uh, the top um, above the entrance to a bank den beaver. So mink, we have a lot of mink in this area. Um, they are extremely secretive though in their habits, so it can be hard to spot them. Um, they are uh, predators. They're a part of the weasel family. So this time of year, they are, um, this is actually a pretty good time uh, to try and catch a glimpse of one. If you're aware of areas where uh, ducks or geese might be nesting, chances are there's a mink nearby. These uh, uh, mink have a, a taste for uh, uh, duck eggs, goose eggs. Um, sometimes they have the duck too. I wanted to thank my friend Paul Meisler for um, uh, this picture he took uh, last week, I believe it was at Grunwald Farm Forest Preserve out uh, in the western part of, uh, oh, west of uh, Main Street uh, in Kane County, uh, Main Street, but uh, Elburn. And Paul was wondering, was this a mink kill? And I, I tried to zoom in as, as, as well as I could on here, Paul, and I, I think you might be right. Uh, mink uh, have no, com uh, they will not hesitate to take prey larger than themselves. Uh, they often kill more than they can feed on. Any of you who have chickens may have had some, uh, some not so great experiences with mink. In fact, last year, um, so I live here in St. Charles. Uh, I was traveling down um, 7th Street, seven blocks west of the river. And uh, again, being the nature nerd that I am, I saw a roadkill up ahead. I am driving by thinking squirrel. It's always squirrel. What else could it be? Well, as I drive by, I see it's a mink. Uh, and I thought, what in the world is, not that mink are aquatic, but they do tend to inhabit wet environments, uh, wetland types of areas. I thought, what is this mink doing on 7th Street? Well, then uh, you know, the brain started to turn a little bit, started thinking about all the backyard chickens that are in that neighborhood. And I'm fairly certain that that lure of chicken and chicken eggs was enough to draw that mink uh, seven blocks from what would be considered its more uh, natural uh, territory. So um, a little bit of confusion out there amongst the general public about a muskrat, a beaver, a mink, and an otter. Um, otters are uh, at this point still kind of rare in central Kane County, but as you travel up, if you go into McHenry County, if you, in fact, if you find yourself on the Nippersick, Nippersick Sink Creek, uh, you may well be able to spot an otter. Uh, the state, uh, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources uh, embarked on an otter reintroduction program back in the 1990s, and that has actually done quite well. Uh, in Northern Illinois, they were released out uh, near the Mississippi River, and they uh, found what they needed there to succeed and survive. They have uh, been gradually uh, marching east of there. Uh, several years ago, there was a river otter spotted in the Chicago River downtown. Um, I uh, had a friend, my friend Corey, um, took a picture last year. This is uh, the Fox River uh, up in the Valley View area. Um, kind of uh, St. Charles South Elgin region. And can anybody here spot the otter? Corey actually saw one right there, that little bump. I uh, said it stuck around for a few days. Um, about this same time, I uh, spoke with a gentleman who showed me a picture of a fish on the ice uh, that was still on Fearson Creek in St. Charles. He said this was supposed to be a picture of an otter, supposed to be a picture of two otters. He saw two otters. He got so excited. He uh, tried to get his camera out. Um, the noise disturbed the otters and what he was left with was the fish that they had brought up to have for dinner. Um, so I don't know about you all, but I believe that one day we are going to be seeing uh, river otters here in Kane County. Fingers crossed. So um, let's keep moving. Like I said, we've got a wild ride here. We've got a lot of creatures I want to uh, make sure you're at least aware of. Some are very topical, like uh, turtles. Um, now that the weather's warming up, turtles are going to be on the move. Uh, we have many, many species of turtles in this area, and a lot of them uh, are moving around. Some are leaving one area they might feel is, is too crowded. Maybe they don't have um, the 
space that they, they feel comfortable with, so they're on the move. But also, uh, female turtles need to leave the water to lay their eggs. Um, they they want to get to somewhere that's a little bit upland. Um, they uh, need to find soil that uh, is easy for them to dig in. That is sometimes right by the side of the road. What do you do if you see a turtle in the road? Uh, well, uh, something large uh, like a snapper, there are, um, I would say, YouTube. There's uh, actually just a, a, a nature center just released a how to move a snapping turtle off the road safely video. Um, but uh, you don't pick it up by the tail. The tail is part of the backbone that's going to cause injury. But there, there are ways um, uh, using different parts of the shell and, and sometimes uh, the mat from your car or if you've got a snow shovel, there's ways to move a snapping turtle off the road. Uh, even if it's not a snapping turtle, if it's just a, you know, a, a painted turtle or, or another species, you want to move it in the direction that it's heading. Uh, turtles' brains are very... Um, hard to change uh, when they have a direction in mind. Uh, just because this side of the road might be closer, if they want to go to the other side, they're going to turn right around and head back. So um, please, please, please um, do what you can to help save our turtles, but do not put yourself in danger uh, to do that. Um, so they, they are on the move right now. Uh, snapping turtles, um, just as an example, their eggs take uh, 75 to 90 days uh, before they hatch. So uh, we're seeing the, the nesting activity now. It won't be until this fall that we'll see the baby snapping turtles. Now, unlike some of the other uh, turtle species in this area, snappers do tend to leave their nests uh, once they hatch, and then they go and they spend the winter um, uh, hibernating in the water. Uh, some of our other species, like our painted turtles, our red-eared sliders, they tend to hatch in their nest, but then not leave till spring. So uh, just yesterday, um, Actually, I saw my friend Holly over at Delmar Woods and her kids had found a baby uh, painted turtle that was on its way to the pond. So uh, be on the lookout right now, uh, not only for uh, the uh, reproductive uh, turtles that are on their way to lay eggs, but also for some of the other babies, uh, the baby um, painted turtles, baby red-eared sliders that might be making their way to water. Um, Spiny soft shells, uh, they are every bit as common as snapping turtles, but they are not quite as mobile. Their, um, their legs are almost flipper-like. Uh, they do leave the water to lay their eggs, but they do not travel as far. This is a, a youngster here. Uh, spiny soft shells are uh, the only soft shell that we have here in the Fox River Valley. If you travel around Illinois, you may encounter the smooth soft shell. Uh, smooth soft shells have uh, more of a, a muddy appearance to them. They do not have uh, these, um, there's a row of bumps up here. You can't really see it too well on this turtle, but um, smooth soft shells uh, do not occur in this area. Um, just be aware if you're traveling around though, you might encounter them. They're much, much more rare than our spinies. Um, these guys get tremendous. I should say these gals get tremendous. The female spiny soft shell turtle can get to be like um, as big as a dinner plate. I always think of those big Dutch apple pancakes, you know, that flop over the side of your plate. They get to be huge, uh, sometimes hubcap size. Um, you will sometimes catch them basking. They are quite wary, uh, so it's hard to sneak up on them, but um, they are uh, present up and down our Fox River. Um, Painted turtles, too, are quite common in Fox River, its tributaries, and also in retention ponds throughout the region. Um, I put in a picture of a red-eared slider. Chuck Peterson, thank you so much for this close-up shot. I um, wanted to show you the difference in these two. Um, the painted turtle has red stripes around the collar, but uh, here where the ear is, there's no red marking. Red-eared slider uh, has the marking up here on the head that is red. In uh, older uh, males, sometimes this whole area will, will become dark. And then you have to look more at the shell. Um, the shell of the um, rendered slider has a little bit more pattern to it than the shell of the painted. The painted also uh, tends to have a little bit more pigment. Uh, these marginal scoots around the edges of the painted turtle are uh, a good giveaway for this species. You'll notice that this uh, turtle, this was actually over at Potawatomi Park in the parking lot. This turtle was making its way 
Uh, it seemed to be going towards the Fox River. Um, if we were to follow its nose, the river would be over there. Um, so we gave a little bit of help because it was very close to a number of vehicles. Um, again, if you, can, um, if you can help a turtle, great. If the turtle doesn't need help though, if it's in your yard and it seems to know where it's going, please leave it be. Um, rescuing it, driving it to, to a forest preserve or something, it's, it's just gonna confuse the turtle. They do um, have sense about them to know where it is they need to go and us interfering, uh, other than to remove them from imminent danger is, is just kind of gonna throw a curve they don't need. Um, I have to tell you guys about this wonderful occurrence. This happened uh, just um, oh, was it five years ago now, uh, just by fluke. Our uh, all field trips um, that we do with the park district were relocated uh, from Otter Creek Bend Wetland Park to a location along the Fox River. And uh, one of the fifth graders participating in the, uh, the netting activity that we had uh, scooped up this little turtle here. This is a stink pot, also known as a musk turtle. Um, they are not very common at all. In fact, there, it had been a few decades since we'd had a uh, record of uh, musk turtles in Kane County. The really cool thing is that this is a baby. So not only did we find a musk turtle, but we found uh, young, which indicates reproduction, which indicates we have a viable breeding population. So uh, some good news there. Uh, welcome to the musk turtles. Um, neat little species. They don't get very big. They are um, easily overlooked, uh, but um, are, uh, tend to inhabit uh, slower moving parts uh, of places like the Fox River. Um, keep an eye out for them. If you see one, let me know. I'd love to hear. We've got more. Um, okay, we're going to step away from what's possibly people's favorite reptile, the turtle, and we're going to go to one that's probably their, what I, seems to be anyway the least favorite of the reptiles, and that is the snake. I'm only going to cover one snake here because it's the one we get the most question about. It's the northern water snake. Uh, I want to say um, th there's always a chance we could have something venomous show up here, but they, we do not have a venomous uh, species native to this area anymore. Uh, there's talk of the Eastern Massasauga, and yes, way, way back in the 1800s, uh, there, were, uh, there was a small population of what is a very small rattlesnake. It's uh, just a little over two feet long. Um, but they, uh, they were never uh, um, present in great numbers in, uh, in our region, and there was a bounty, I think it was a dollar, that people could get for turning in a dead rattlesnakes. So they disappeared pretty quickly with the uh, showing uh, up of the European settlers. Um, when people see these snakes, they see dark snake and they see my water and they think, oh my heavens, it's a water moccasin. Uh, part of that is, is uh, the problem is compounded by the use of um, uh, common names. Water moccasin is sometimes used to refer to non-venomous species too in certain parts of the country. But I just wanted to show you real quick. This snake has a blotchy pattern to it. And you'll notice by the neck, this blotchy pattern uh, is actually rings that go across the body uh, from one side to the other as a band. They look uh, like a band. As we move down the body of the snake, that band breaks up and it becomes blotches that alternate. So it's a quick and dirty way to see if you're looking at a uh, northern water snake, a non-venomous uh, water snake. I also wanted to point out that they are not, they do not provide uh, any sort of uh, parental care, but um, this was kind of a, a lucky opportunity to find not only an adult, but also a juvenile uh, basking on warm day uh, pond side here in, uh, in the Fox River Valley. Uh, now, they're not venomous. It doesn't mean that they don't have teeth. Um, this, in fact, Beth Nutter, thank you very much for this photo. Uh, this was at our field trip uh, for our King County Certified Naturalist Group last, uh, last spring. This is a northern water snake that was on side uh, at Leroy Oaks Forest Preserve. They are the only snake I know of that will bite first and ask questions later. Um, they will actually pursue. I've seen them go after um, the fish that are being reeled in. I saw them chase a dog, and not them. one snake chase a dog one time that had gotten too close. Uh, they do not hesitate to bite. Now the bite is, um, 
it's very shallow because their teeth are very small, but they are very sharp. So, so you bleed, you'll, you'll know you got bit. Um, but look, I'm fine. <laughs> no big deal. I'd rather get bit by a snake and get a paper cut. Um, uh, briefly, frogs, we have uh, plus or minus 13 species of frogs in the Chicago region. Uh, if you're in and around the Fox River, though, you're going to see um, probably, you, you might see or hear a toad, uh, but I threw these two in because these are our most common river inhabitants, the green frog and the bullfrog. They're our largest species. A full-size green frog is about the size of a fist. A bullfrog can be the size of a dessert plate. Um, very large. Um, there's a kind of a neat trick if you spot either one of these uh, in, um, these types of frogs. Um, the males of both these species get a very large, this is their ear, and the ear grows very large um, in the males, which is kind of interesting. Um, frogs call during their mating season. That's how the males prove their fitness to the females. The females are the ones that listen, yet it's the males that have the bigger ears. I guess they want to stay awake, uh, aware of the competition. Uh, to tell these two apart, um, this is a very fat green frog, but if you look closely, you can see there's a stripe. Uh, it's um, actually a fold of skin there called the dorsolateral fold. Uh, in green frogs, that fold extends down the body. In the uh, bullfrog, there's no fold. Uh, there is just a, a little fold of skin that goes around the ear, but nothing extends down the back. So even though these species can appear somewhat similar, you can uh, rely on that fold to help you uh, make the call of which is which. Um, people love to uh, recreate at the Fox River. Fishing is huge uh, up and down um, the river uh, corridor. Uh, game fish like uh, catfish, we've got a thriving smallmouth bass population. For years, uh, this uh, middle stretch of the Fox River was catch and release only, so our, our smallmouth bass are doing very well. And we uh, get a fair amount of large muskie that are, are um, caught uh, in different stretches along the Fox River. Um, but there's a lot more to the story than just the game fish. Uh, we do have common carp. I threw them in only because this is something I get calls about sometimes. People think that they've found a fish in distress. If you're walking along the river uh, now as we get into May and you see a lot of thrashing around, if you see uh, uh, dorsal fins breaking the water, uh, you might even hear some splashing. Uh, relax, everything's okay. It is our common carp breeding. They breed in muddy shallows up and down the Fox River. Um, very common sight. It will catch your eye and your ear though. Um, what I really want to let you know about though is the non-game fish. These guys are the nuts and bolts of what makes our river tick. Uh, they are a sign of uh, clean water. They all need a lot uh, well oxygenated water. Uh, they are, some of them are as colorful as what you see in a tropical fish store. Uh, this is a rainbow darter. Here's a banded darter. These guys, central stone rollers, um, the males uh, acquire these tubercles during the breeding season. Uh, not having a bad skin day. They're supposed to be there. Um, central stone lo lo rollers are um, one of several species of fish that will create a nest. The male will build a nest out of stones, uh, but they were actually named for that uh, tendency because they, they do it so well. But uh, non-game fish, if we didn't have non-game fish, we wouldn't have our game fish population. Uh, wonderful, um, uh, highly colorful when they're in their breeding mode. Um, species. Uh, I wanted to thank the uh, North American Native Fish Association for these photos. Um, you can visit their website if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, native fish and native fish keeping. Um, just wanted to, to toss these out there too. This is an um, animal that is prevalent up and down the Fox River uh, and throughout the Fox River Valley because we have, we have seven native species of crayfish here, um, but we have uh, one non-native as well. Of those seven native species, three are burrowing. So if you're a distance away from uh, a creek or a river, but uh, you're seeing uh, stacks of, of mud, we call them chimneys, you are in burrowing crayfish territory. The digger crayfish, the prairie crayfish, the uh, devil crayfish, all will um, dig burrows in which they live. They'll dig, dig down till they reach water and then um, they'll come out and forage, uh, usually at night or when, when it's wet out. 
Um, I included this picture because um, if you're so inclined to go uh, wading in, in the water and you net a crayfish uh, and you see, oh my goodness, what kind of growth is this? This is called uh, crayfish in berry. These are actually uh, young. Uh, crayfish, believe it or not, do provide a little bit of maternal care. The female uh, carries the eggs and then uh, her offspring underneath her tail for a period of days until they uh, shed a time or two, they shed their exoskeletons and then they become independent. But uh, crayfish and berry is happening right now. Uh, and then I wanted to toss this picture out as well because we do have that one non-native, this is Orconectes rusticus, this is the rusty crayfish. And when we talk about non-native species, we usually think, oh, it's exotic, it's from Asia, it's from Europe, it was introduced here, you know, it came long distances to, to uh, come into our waters. These actually came from the Ohio River Valley. They were um, sold as bait. A lot of um, people, when they're done fishing, feel that whether it's a minnow or a nightcrawler or a crayfish, uh, they can let it go. And um, this uh, rusty crayfish, which breeds uh, quite readily, uh, breeds in, in large numbers, uh, creates large numbers of offspring, and it's uh, somewhat aggressive. Um, by being introduced through um, fishing bait has, has um, been appearing uh, throughout our Fox River Valley. You can uh, identify it pretty readily by this rusty red spot that's on the side there. It almost looks like somebody dipped a finger in barn paint and picked them up by the carapace. Uh, we are seeing some um, interbreeding with the northern crayfish, which is one of our native aquatic species, but um, we actually, uh, here at St. Charles, we had the opportunity to combine with the Fox Valley Park District and with the King County Forest Preserve District last fall, uh, no, I'm sorry, last August, um, and held what was called a rusty rodeo, where we harvested uh, a fair number of these from down there at Glenwood Park in Batavia. Um, don't know what our programming future looks like uh, for later this year, but uh, rusty rodeos are an idea that we would like to uh, further to kind of help keep the population of these um, uh, this non-native species down. Now, I gotta admit, I lied a little. We do have one other snake. Um, queen snakes are showing up with a little bit more regularity these days. This is um, a semi-aquatic snake, as is the uh, water snake. Um, but big difference is that queen snakes eat freshly molted crayfish. A crayfish uh, being covered with an exoskeleton as it grows, it needs to shed its skin. Um, just like if you've ever eaten a peeled shrimp, you know, you'd rather eat it with the peel off than with the peel on. Um, queen snakes will eat those freshly molted crayfish. As we've seen an increase in the number of uh, rusty crayfish in the area, we're also seeing queen snakes in areas where we have not seen them in years and years. Uh, this individual was in Fearson Creek. Uh, we've also seen them in Fearson Creek Fen. There's a few other places too where uh, queen snakes have been showing up. And I, I kind of think, I, I again, don't have the data, but it seems as though you know, increase in uh, crayfish, uh, increase in snakes eating them, there might be a connection. All right, let's move on. Uh, insects, um, talk about what makes a river tick. Um, there are so many different species, that, again, we could not just do another talk, we could do a, a, you know, a semester long program on insects of the uh, Fox River. I just wanted to highlight two that um, people interact with the most, uh, whether they want to or not. One is the caddisfly, the other is the mayfly. Both of these uh, species um, spend the first part of their life, which is usually, I don't know, a year or so, in the water. Up here on the upper right, we have uh, the uh, larvae of the uh, burrow, it's called a burrowing mayfly. Oops. Um, uh, you can see those big um, arms, uh, forearms up here made for digging. Uh, when it uh, emerges, it's, it becomes this species of mayfly, Hexagenia is the genus. And um, they'll come out uh, en masse, but the, the masses are, are smaller. Uh, they do need clean water and our, our Fox River is it's, it's clean. I wouldn't call it pristine. Um, the areas where these uh, mayflies occur, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you know, maybe dozens. Now where we'll see thousands, maybe millions, 
is the caddisflies. Now, this caddisfly, I will say, this is not a river species, this is a pond species, but I wanted to show you what they do. Um, caddisfly larvae are, are, well, actually, caddisflies are kind of the aquatic equivalent of moths. Uh, moths uh, belong to the order Lepidoptera, which means scaly wing. Um, well, the caddisflies, they do not have scaly wings, they have um, hairy wings. And they, their larvae look a lot like caterpillars, but they live in water as opposed to on land. Um, some caddisfly larvae are, are little and green and um, free living. Others might spin a, a little web, much again like a caterpillar can spin silk. Um, but uh, many of them will construct little houses to protect their soft green bodies. Uh, again, this is the pond species. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see me right now, but I've got my caddisfly earrings on because caddisflies will also make cases out of stones and sand to protect their bodies. Uh, where they interact with humans is um, when they have that mass emergence. This happ happens several times over the course of the uh, summer months uh, along the river towns. And um, you know, I've seen people using their windshield wipers to get the, the bodies off their car. I know here in downtown St. Charles, we have to sweep them out of the buildings. People think, why do we have so many of these? Well, it is a wonderful sign. If, if an animal is able to live for a year, a little green caterpillar is able to live for a year in the water, uh, that's a sign that our water is clean enough to support that kind of life. And so I always you know, do a little happy dance when we have a caddis fly emergence. Of course, uh, um, again, I'm a nature nerd. <laughs> um, now, freshwater mussels, another workhorse in the, uh, the river bottom, rarely seen alive. Not to say that we don't have live individuals in the river, but uh, where we tend to see them most is when their shells, uh, when they've been predated or if we've had a dry spell and um, the water levels have dropped. But I, I show you here a couple of our more common species. Uh, on the right here, uh, the ellipse is actually an Illinois um, species of uh, concern, um, but it is present in certain uh, numbers of the tributaries of the Fox River. On the right, we have um, a species that prefers a little bit larger uh, body of water, which would be the Fox River. This is the white heel splitter. I threw this picture in because you get a bonus. Um, here's a turtle leech and the turtle leech's eggs. Now, uh, again, I didn't want to run over um, time. I do have a very endearing video. If you ever run into me, I can show it to you. Uh, this uh, uh, turtle leech and her eggs were found as part of a muscle class we attended last summer. Uh, of course, she got a little disturbed when I picked up the shell uh, and um, she moved away from her eggs. But in the video, she oh so gently moves back over and puts, uh, and I'm, I'm using she, I'm anthropomorphizing. Uh, you know, leeches are actually, they are hermaphroditic. They have both male and female parts. But the, let's just say the parent leech came over and wrapped its body around and protected the eggs from the uh, evil nature nerd that was, that was uh, disturbing them. Now, mussels, again, another topic that we could uh, go on and on and on about, or I could anyway. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do, though, is show you a little video that is going to explain to you um, just why uh, these creatures are so enthralling. Now, I, I will preface this by saying um, freshwater mussels as a group are one of the most endangered taxa in the world. Uh, roughly 70% of freshwater mussel species are threatened, endangered, or already extinct. Um, here in uh, Fox River Valley, a lot of mussels disappeared back um, when they were harvested to make uh, shell buttons back in the early 1900s. Um, impacts to water quality have also threatened their survival. Um, again, with the passage of the Clean Water Act, things have gotten a little bit better for mussels. Uh, they do, though, they have an intricate relationship with fish. Um, as long as our fish population remains healthy, we can hold out hope that our mussels will too. What I'd like to do is show you just how these mussels and these fish interact. I've got a video here. Um, you'll notice when it starts, they're going to say in the waters of Missouri, it's the same thing as the waters of the Fox River. Um, just a fascinating, it's about three minutes long. Stick with me here. 
Let me know what you think. In the streams of Missouri, is the lumpsillus muscle, a simple with an extraordinary life cycle. To reach adulthood, its young must spend part of their lives inside a fish, the largemouth bass. To get there, the mussels must make physical contact, a difficult task, as mussels don't swim. But the bass has a weakness. It's a voracious predator of small fish, particularly darters. Even the slightest wriggle of a darter's tail will attract bass. Believe it or not, the fish on the mussel is an imitation, a perfect replica that will lure bass within striking range. The mussel can somehow sense approaching fish and wriggles its lure faster to entice them. gets the twitching just right, the remarkable likeness should do the rest. On impact, the muscle squirts its young into the bass's mouth. These snap shut on the gills like spring-loaded traps. Here they stay drawing blood from the fish until several weeks later they drop off as tiny, fully formed muscles. Also a favorite prey of the bass are these striped shiners. Some mussels mimic them. Considering mussels are blind and have never seen a shiner, the likeness is incredible. The eyes, fins, and even the stripe look just right, yet the muscle knows nothing of its own appearance. These lures have evolved because bass more often attack muscles that look like fish, so fishy-looking muscles leave more descendants. After millions of years of blind evolution, this process of selection has turned muscle flesh into a lifelike lure. It takes a good imitation to fool a bass in clear water, and some of them are incredible. This starter mimic even has a mouth which gulps. This muscle is the same species, but its curious leopard print design may not find a taker, and its genes will go no further. This lure looks pretty good, but the bass is unconvinced and turns it down. Muscle lures are constantly improving, but fish are getting ever better at recognizing fakes. It's another arms race, and it's still creating diversity in the streams of Missouri to this day. Well, I am we're about at two, so two o'clock. So just okay. I got. I think I got uh, three more slides. Okay, great video. A um, little tip: as you find yourself along the Fox River, um, um, you know, there's there's so many places that you can look. But a little um, place a tip that I followed now for many years is to try to find out where the water treatment plant outflows are. Now, um, our treatment plants are held to strict standards. Uh, they're not uh, releasing uh, toxic uh, chemicals or they, the water needs to be at a neutral pH. There's a lot of nutrients though that are coming into the water. Where there's nutrients, there's uh, plant growth and where there's plant growth, there are things that eat plants and then there's the things that eat the things that eat the plants. Anyway, uh, this uh, this particular stretch of river is in St. Charles. Um, 
but uh, pretty much anywhere you can find a water treatment plant outflow, uh, you're going to find an abundance of uh, river life. Another area, um, this is down at Red Oak Nature Center. The deck at Red Oak, if you're familiar with that, is right across from the water treatment plant for um, the uh, Mooseheart Child City. Um, that, along with Mill Creek, makes this a wonderfully uh, rich area. You can see the plant growth here that erupts in the summertime. Great spot to uh, see uh, herons fishing, uh, softshell turtles digging nests, lots of activity here. Um, those of you who are paying attention, those of you who are still with us, you might say, but Pam, this was called uh, From Coyotes to Bees. We haven't talked about either one. So just to wrap up, I do want to say that the coyotes are present throughout the Fox River Valley and throughout Illinois. Um, no one really knows how many coyotes we have. Um, the, the coyotes' um, relationship with the river, though, is one of might provide a little bit uh, in the way of food. They do uh, take eggs too from uh, goose and if they can from mallard nests, um, but they, uh, they do use the river very, very much for transportation uh, from getting from place to place as long as it's frozen. I took this picture on January 25th, 2016. I remember the day it was one degree below zero. This portion of the river, this is by Potawatomi Park, was frozen solid. And here we had uh, actually a pair of coyotes that jumped down and uh, took a walk up river. Pretty neat, huh? Um, I actually was walking by the river uh, uh, just a, a couple of months ago, January 31st of 2020. And uh, yeah, there's no ice. Think about that uh, as our, our uh, winters get warmer, um, it might be less brutal on our exposed skin, but our natural processes are being strongly affected by that. Um, the other part of our title was bees. There is so much bee activity right now. The, the honeybees are out and, and they're doing their thing, but our native bees too. We have a lot of uh, native bees that are heavily reliant on those woodland wildflowers that erupt. Um, just, uh, they have to get out and um, put their pollen out before the leaves come out on the trees. Once uh, the, the leaves are out, it's too shady for woodland wildflowers. So there's a many, many host uh, and uh, pollinator relationships between our native wildflowers and our native bees. As we get into um, uh, later parts of the year, we've got our sweat bees. Um, this is a longhorn bee, a catfish Andy. I don't know if you're out there, but you had sent me this picture last uh, summer of a longhorn bee on thistle. You'll notice that none of these really are all that bee-like, um, but they are. There's uh, several hundred different species of uh, native bees that work to pollinate our native landscapes, and uh, without them, our native flowers are uh, would really be in trouble. Uh, since we did uh, push it uh, right to the limit here, I am going to close with uh, a thought that I think we can all relate to right now. Remember, I'm uh, I'm a nature nerd. I'm not a comedian, but um, oh, I forgot one more slide. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee, I just threw this in at the end. Believe it or not, this is a, a, an endangered species, but we do have rusty patch bumblebees. Uh, they've been spotted in a couple of different areas along the Fox River, areas where that have been planted with Monarda. Some of you may know that as bee balm. Bee balm, um, especially the later blooming uh, plants, uh, these, these uh, insects are attracted to that rusty patch um, the name comes from this band back here, um, kind of right where the, the uh, thorax and the abdomen meet. Um, if you happen to be out on, and I, I, I'm not a photographer, I have tried to take pictures of bees, not with uh, much success, but this, if you see um, uh, a, a bumblebee that has this rusty patch on it, please, please, please uh, let me know. Uh, we'd like to get word out to, so that we could go and um, have um, someone else check that out too to see if there are other breeding uh, populations in the area. All right, with that, I'm gonna throw my, uh, my feel good uh, pun to end this program. Don't worry, please just be happy. All right, with that, um, Trisha, are we gonna open it up to uh, questions? Jane? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Um, remember to all of our attendees, if you do have any questions, please go ahead and pop them in that Q&A box. 
that you'll see across the menu at the bottom. Um, I know I saw a couple of them in chat. We'll try to find those again, but other messages have been going and so there's a chance we could miss them that way. So um, the one question that we have so far in the Q&A is how do you tell the difference between a mayfly and a dragonfly? Oh, good question. All right, so a dragonfly, um, there's a couple different things. A dragonfly um, is going to have a, a long, um, in fact, my grandmother often called dragonflies darning needles. It's a, a needle-like body, and most of our area dragonflies are going to be larger than our area mayflies. A mayfly um, has a, um, it's, it's got a weaker flight, and um, it's, uh, it, the wing shape, uh, dragonflies will have two very prominent pairs of wings across its needle-like body. The, the mayfly is going to be smaller. Mayflies also have two what they call uh, circe or tails that come off the back. And, um, and th their flight is going to be weaker. Uh, they tend to not travel too far from water. Dragonflies, of course, can be found around water. They can be found away from water. Um, but a dragonfly flies like a fighter jet. You know, that needle goes through the air, um, very purposeful. They might be actually hunting mayflies. They are, um, uh, dragonflies do eat a lot of our uh, local insects. All right, and then a couple of questions about the video. Do the muscle eggs in the lungs of the bass affect the lifespan of the bass? And does it hurt the fish when the muscle injects eggs into it? Oh, great questions too. Um, now we, haven't you know spoken to a bass personally about this, but the, it does not. The, the um, they do live parasitically, but they're unless the fish is severely weakened, weakened from some other cause, it hasn't proven to be uh, detrimental to the fish's health. Um, and they do fall fall off after a period of weeks, so it's not like they're sucking blood for you know months and months at a time. Um, most uh, of the fish that are uh, healthy enough to attempt to uh, predate on a, a fish lure that the muscle's putting out are going to be healthy enough to withstand having those glochidia on the um, on the gills. All right, next question. What places along the fox have the highest chance to see bald eagles, winter or summer? Um, well, you know, um, right now, as we're going into summer, that, that hot spot then, and again, I, I, I am, if you couldn't tell, pretty centrally cane-centric, cane, um, cane um, but uh, the Mooseheart bald eagles are, their nest is in the parking lot of the football stadium at Mooseheart, which is at the corner of Mooseheart Road and 31. Uh, that area I showed with the, the aerial view of um, uh, the Fox River where they removed the South Batavia Dam. Uh, that's a, a pretty good summer uh, fishing spot for them. Um, if uh, you want to park at Glenwood Park and, and walk uh, along the Fox River Trail, there is a little bridge right behind Funway that gives you a good view of those islands and uh, you can oftentimes spot an eagle there. Uh, Wintertime, um, it's actually a little bit easier because we do have those individuals coming from the north. Um, uh, Langham Woods in uh, St. Charles, there's a, a tree um, to the north end of the sled hill that uh, sometimes has an eagle or two in it. Uh, Boy Scout Island uh, in central um, St. Charles, it's right across from Pottawatomie Park. There's a dead tree at the end of Boy Scout um, that often has eagles. Um, Gail Borden Library up in uh, Elgin. There's uh, oftentimes eagles spotted there. Um, they are kind of traveling about uh, two in the winter time. I've spotted an eagle. Uh, Hickory Knolls is the nature center here in St. Charles. Uh, there was an eagle feeding on a, a deer kill um, at the back of the Hickory Knolls natural area last year. So you can run into them. They are, they are primarily fish eaters, but um, they are scavengers too. So um, those uh, uh, places that I mentioned are um, pretty good, pretty good bets. Okay, uh, next question. Do we have many foxes in the area? Oh, foxes. Yeah, you know, um, so the fox and the coyote have an interesting relationship. Um, and what, what I've seen um, is that our, our foxes tend to um, 
hang out more in neighborhoods, uh, taking shelter under decks and in culverts, whereas the coyotes are more in the open spaces. Now, interesting, uh, it kind of had a border war uh, out at Hickory Knolls uh, over the last year. Um, the coyote, uh, coyotes have, have lived in our natural area for uh, many years. The fox in the area have uh, kind of stayed in the neighborhoods surrounding the nature center. Well, last year, the foxes decided to come back over into the natural area and we saw, you can tell, um, uh, we're going to diverge just a little bit, we're going to talk about signs that these animals leave behind. Uh, scat is a poop. Um, if uh, a coyote is in an area uh, that, that scat that it leaves behind, it's, um, it's as much a sign uh, to other canines as it is a um, method of relief for the coyote. Um, but it's going to be um, as big around as your thumb or larger. A fox scat, however, is going to be more like um, the circumference or uh, diameter of your uh, pinky finger. Um, and what we were seeing at Hickory Knolls was an increase in the number of coyote and fox scats. And fox will also leave a, um, a scent behind their, uh, their urine has a, a kind of a, or the, the, the scent that they leave behind has a kind of a, uh, almost a skunky smell. I call it, it's a little bit sweeter than skunk. If you're a, a connoisseur of such scents, um, you, you can learn to tell the difference between it's, it's much less um, potent than the, uh, the, the skunk spray, but um, you can catch whiffs of that and you can be aware of uh, fox in the area. Um, unfortunately, both are wild canines. In fact, I even got an email this morning from a gentleman who'd taken a picture of a woodchuck. Uh, fur, furry creatures in this area um, are um, being exposed uh, to mange. Um, I think it's sarcoptic mange, but it's, uh, that's a, a, a mite uh, that causes the animals to itch, uh, and they, they scratch a lot, and they, they bite a lot, and they remove their fur as they're doing that. They cause scratches, which then get infected, and that does not bode well for the animal in the long term. Fox seem to be a little bit more uh, prone to that. Uh, although um, I saw just a really sad looking coyote, uh, and I haven't actually seen them since in my neighborhood. This goes back maybe two or three years. Um, so um, uh, quieter neighborhoods that have maybe larger expanses between the houses, and that also, fox love to uh, dig their dens underneath existing structures. Um, but it, Backyard sheds are common places, sometimes under a deck, if the deck isn't used much. But um, uh, we, we do see them, and, and the, the fox pictures I've uh, had sent to me this spring have had very large litters. So um, if they can survive the, this mange that's out there, um, they, there's plenty of prey for them. Okay. Uh, Terry chimed in that male rusty patch bumblebees really like Joe pieweed and swamp milkweed and can often Thank be found sleeping under those leaves. The Fox River Valley is proving to be a stronghold for those species. Awesome. Thanks, Terry. Um, let's see. I saw more snapping turtles last year than I've seen in my entire life. Is there a reason they were so <laughs> active last year? Um, well, they are another species that's, that's done well in this area. Um, I don't know, um, I'm trying to think uh, what might have caused more of them to be moving around. Um, um, Wasn't it particularly wet last spring? There, there may have been some flooding. flooding. They may have had to walk a little bit farther. Yeah, yeah you're right. that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. Some, um, and, and again, to, to get to uh, dry ground, high enough ground where the nests won't be washed out, yeah. um, they might have to travel a little bit farther. Uh, snapping turtles too, they're um, probably our most prolific species. Uh, they can lay, they, they'll lay multiple clutches. Uh, female can produce, uh, she can have you know, 20, 30, 40 eggs in a clutch and she would do that a couple of times. So um, not all those little guys are gonna make it. Um, I call little snapping turtles nature's Oreos. A lot of things like to eat them, but they, um, they, they do have a, a very high reproductive capacity and, and the way we've got, uh, retention ponds uh, scattered throughout the area. They've got a lot of habitat too. I just want to chime in on your stink pot turtle. When I worked at Isle Isla Cache along the, uh, the, I always get it wrong. I always say the wrong one. I think it's just Plains River. Um, 
I was, I was walking along the sidewalk one January morning. It was a particularly warm January morning and I saw what looked like a little clot of dirt on the ground. I thought, oh, that's a little cute turtle shaped clot of dirt. And it wasn't, it was a little teeny tiny stink pot turtle. I mean, he was, his shell was as big as my thumbprint. Oh my gosh, what a thrill. Why he came out in January, I don't know, but I figured, you know, if he stays out like this, he's not going to make it. So I ended up bringing him in uh-huh. and caring for him throughout the rest of the winter. And then in spring, we released him back into the river again. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah, I, but he was so tiny. Finding things small enough for him to eat <laughs> was not. <laughs> oh, I bet. What did you have to uh, get like little wax worms or? Well, fortunately, I have a worm bin, and so we were finding the little hatchling worms. Okay. Put those in form, and he would eat those, but yeah. Wow. So I love turtles, and finding that little stink, we called him Biddy. So <laughs> the, the winter that we fostered Biddy was very, very fun. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, back to questions. We have, um, is the mayfly the same as river flies we see at night around the lights? Um, you know... They could be. Now, if you travel, if you go up to Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin, in fact, um, Tom Skilling will sometimes show on uh, his weather reports the mayfly uh, eruptions that are showing up on radar. Uh, other rivers uh, have um, higher populations of mayflies than we do in this area. Um, a lot of people just call um, what they see coming, you know, flying around the river is river bugs. Um, and in this, uh, Fox River is primarily the caddisfly uh, as opposed to the mayfly that we see. All right, uh, let's see. Of all the species that depend on a healthy river, avian fish, et cetera, which have you personally witnessed as the largest comeback as the fox has improved? Oh boy. Um, I would say, um, uh, I'm going to go with osprey. Uh, I'm going to go with the bald eagle would be the obvious choice <laughs> um, because of their uh, much publicized, but that's a, a national comeback. The, the osprey uh, again, has not been terribly common in Illinois and to be seeing them in the numbers that we're seeing them now is, is really, um, really stunning. They, um, in addition to those uh, Fermilab osprey that I mentioned there, also there's a population up near Pratt's Wayne Woods, which would be to the uh, the east of uh, Fox River, more in DuPage County, but they do come over and fish here in the fox as well. All right. Uh, we have a nest of great horned owls in the neighborhood. The babies are in and out of the nest walking, but not flying. How long mm-hmm. will they stick around? Not too much longer. And I'll, I'll, I'll say it is always harder on humans to watch uh, baby birds um, grow up than it is for the birds themselves. They look so fluffy and so helpless. But with that, uh, that uh, behavior you're seeing now, um, they're probably doing a little bit of this, a little flapping of the wings. That's called branching in a, in a traditional nest. Um, you know, a cup less, they a lot of times will uh, use a great uh, red-tailed hawk nest. And the babies can in, uh, flap their wings. Um, they oftentimes, um, they, well, I, I shouldn't say oftentimes, but they are able to uh, leave the nest even if they can't fly. Um, because great horned owls reuse nests, there's always a chance that nest isn't going to make it until the babies are fully fledged. Um, nests fall apart, especially if they're using a squirrel nest or something that might be a little more loosely constructed to start with. Um, but they, um, they are going to be reliant on their parents now for several more months. Uh, it's kind of, I've always found it kind of funny that the uh, great horned owls and the red-tailed hawk, their offspring, um, parents start kicking them out about the same time human parents start kicking their offspring out to get them to go back to school. So as you hear kids protesting, mom, I don't want to go to the bus. I don't want to go to school. You can also hear red-tailed hawks and, um, uh, in the evenings, you can hear owls uh, screaming, why aren't you feeding me? Why do, what do you mean I have to feed myself? Uh, so they, um, they are um, leaving the nest now, depending on when the, the, uh, the young that are in your neighborhood, uh, depending on when they hatched, um, 
it's usually anytime after six weeks they can start leaving the nest, but they do stick around and are under the parents' care now for several months. All right. Um, two quick questions and a statement, and then I think we're going to have to wrap it up here. Um, Melissa says Osprey flying over Spring Bluff Fen in Elgin for quite some time on Sunday. Excellent. And uh, do pelicans spend time along the fox in Cane? I know in the upper chain they are around some. Yes. Um, very first time, uh, I think I just wrote about this a few weeks ago, very first time I heard about pelicans, it's, and it's the white, the uh, American, uh, the white pelican that we see here. Um, they, they arrived on April Fool's Day uh, in the early 2000s, and I thought for sure someone was playing a joke on me saying, hey, Pam, you know, did you go see the pelicans? And yeah, right. But they were here. They were here. Uh, they have returned every year since then, although this year they were noticeably late. Uh, I believe it's just been within the last week to 10 days that we've been seeing them. Um, they are on their way, uh, for the most part, they're on their way um, kind of to the northwest. They go to the prairie potholes in the upper plains um, in the, uh, North Dakota and in southern Canada. All right, and finally, the last question is, are the park districts open now to the public or will that begin opening up in June? You know, our parks, and I can't speak for, for all the agencies, I haven't kept up with everybody's rules and regs, but I know here in St. Charles, we have kept our parks and trails open, but we have uh, locked our uh, restrooms and we've encouraged, uh, we put up signs saying to, to not use our picnic shelters or our playground equipment, but, um, I'm fairly certain King County's trails are open as well with those same uh, caveats, the shelters and the outhouses are closed. Um, but it's, um, it's very easy to distance yourself in a wide open area. And again, it is so nice out today, folks. I hope you're able to get out and enjoy it. All right, with that, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much everyone for attending. I think this was a record participation in our webinar today. So um, once the, the recording has, wrapped up, I will go ahead and uh, post this to our YouTube channel if anybody else wants to come back and see it later or look at all these beautiful pictures again. Um, I loved your video. That video was awesome. Um, <laughs> but thank you, everyone. And thanks so much, Pam. This was great. Thanks, everybody. It was great. Thank you. Take care. Yep. Enjoy the sunshine. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.